Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Ohio EPA's 2022 Virtual Compliance Assistance Conference. My name is Bill Narotsky, and I'm with the Division of Environmental Response and Revitalization here at Ohio EPA. And I will be moderating the Hazardous Waste Program 101 session. Ohio EPA's 2022 Virtual Compliance Assistance Conference has 24 sessions over two weeks. Today, we have three sessions focusing on hazardous waste regulations. Registration information and a conference agenda are loca located on the Ohio EPA's conference webpage. We hope you are able to join us for additional conference sessions. Please remember, it's never too late to sign up for the next conference session, and all sessions are being recorded for you to review later. Before we get started, we would like to point out, point your attention to one of today's environmental useful facts. Ohio EPA's Voluntary Action Plan, or VAP, provides individuals and companies a way to reuse and redevelop contaminated sites and can help clean up the site if necessary. If you would like more information about the VAP program, scan the QR code on this slide. And with that, I would like to turn it over to our presenter, Christy Shipley from our Hazardous Waste Compliance Assurance Section. Christy is a lead worker in the Hazardous Waste Compliance Assurance Section in the Division of Environmental Response and Revitalization. She provides compliance assistance to the regulated community and technical assistance to Ohio EPA hazardous waste staff. Christy also works on escalated enforcement cases and has helped implement the new hazardous waste pharmaceutical rules in Ohio. The session's behind the scene subject matter experts are Zach Cablon and Tammy Heffelfinger. Here's Christy. Thank you, Bill, for that introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us this morning um, for today's first session on hazardous waste. So I'm going to be giving you just a really big picture overview on how we regulate hazardous waste here in Ohio. We're going to talk about the types of waste that we do and don't regulate, the types of businesses we regulate, ways that we implement our program, and we'll touch a little bit on how we monitor compliance, the ways that we enforce our rules, and also talk briefly about the remedial side of our program as well. So before we get into the details about our program, I'd just like to take a minute to kind of um, give you some background information so that you can understand you know, where we started with environmental regulations. So back in 1965 is when Congress enacted the Solid Waste Disposal Act, and that was geared towards creating a framework for states to manage their solid waste, and it created some safety standards for landfills. Now, they determined that this really wasn't sufficient. There was some mismanagement of waste, including hazardous waste. So in 1976, um, they remodeled it. And that's when they created the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, or RICRA. Now they went back and they strengthened it again in 1984. And that was to discourage land disposal of hazardous waste and also gain the ability to address releases under corrective action. They also wanted to minimize hazardous waste generation by encouraging legitimate recycling and source reduction. So the goals of RCRA, well, first and foremost, to protect human health and the environment. You're going to hear me mention that a lot during this presentation. That's because it's a driving force for why we do what we do. But there are a few other goals as well. To conserve energy and natural resources, to reduce the amount of waste that's generated by reducing um, the use of resources, encouraging reuse and recycling. That's the recovery portion and to also ensure that wastes are managed in an environmentally sound manner. Well, when you think RICRA, you might think it's just for hazardous waste, but Congress actually created um, different subtitles and the hazardous waste regulations live in subtitle C. Subtitle D is for solid waste, I is underground storage tanks, and J was for medical waste. We refer to the hazardous waste regulations as a cradle to grave management system. And that's because we regulate hazardous waste from the initial point of generation to the ultimate disposal. 
So we have rules in place for businesses that generate hazardous waste, businesses that transport the hazardous waste, and then also for the facilities that are doing the recycling and the treatment or the disposal of hazardous waste. Congress decided that states could be delegated and authorized to implement a hazardous waste program, but they need to have the necessary laws and rules in place prior to becoming a delegated program. Here in Ohio, we have our own statutes, and from that, we are able to adopt rules. And you'll notice that um, most often our regulations mirror the federal regulations. In 1990, Ohio was able to obtain authorization and became a delegated program. So we implement the hazardous waste program here instead of US EPA. And the hazardous waste program is not static. Things continue to change and evolve over time. So when US EPA comes out with new rules, we are required to pick them up and become authorized for them. Some recent examples of changes and new adoptions include the generator improvement rules and the hazardous waste pharmaceutical rules that we adopted back in 2020. And right now we do have a few more in the pipeline, like the definition of solid waste, RICRA organic air emissions, and also some changes to the universal waste rules regarding aerosol cans, which I think will be made sometime in mid-October. Now the authorization process requires us to submit our rules to US EPA for their review and approval. So what do we regulate? Well, obviously hazardous waste and under that includes what we refer to as universal waste. And the rules for universal waste have less burdensome requirements. Universal wastes are generated by most industries and they generally have a lesser potential to cause harm. And we also want to encourage the recovery of the constituents that are found in these wastes. Because of these things, um, they have their own set of rules. Universal wastes include things like fluorescent lamps, mercury containing devices, batteries. And here in Ohio, we have some state specific universal wastes, and those include paint paint related waste as well as antifreeze. Our program also regulates things that are recycled but are still hazardous waste. And then we have used oil. And this one's a little unique because it encompasses oil after it's used that would be hazardous and also oil that's af after it's used that would be non-hazardous. Now Congress realized that there were some challenges with used oil. Due to the nature of the material, it can cause significant harm, but they also wanted to encourage the recovery and recycling of it. So there are specific rules dedicated to used oil, and those are located in chapter 3745-279. We have rules for um, those businesses that generate used oil, those that transport it, collect it, burn it, market it, and then also for the businesses that process the used oil to refine it and then make it a lubricant again. Ohio EPA and US EPA's def definitions differ a little bit regarding waste. At the federal level, it's called a solid waste, but in Ohio, we had to make a slight variation because when we when we adopted the hazardous waste laws, we had previously defined solid waste, so we couldn't use that same language. And instead we use the term waste, which is any discarded material that is not specifically excluded from regulation. Things are considered discarded if they are abandoned, if they are recycled, if they are inherently waste-like, and then the rule also specifically calls out military munitions as discarded materials. Now, most commonly, we're going to see things that are abandoned, so things that are disposed, burned, um, accumulated and stored or treated before or in um, place of being disposed. But recycling is also a common method of discarding. 
And there's a little bit of misconception surrounding recycling because people think that if something is being recycled, that it's not a waste, but that's not the case. It could still be subject to our regulations. There are some things that are excluded from our regulations, such as domestic sewage, industrial discharges, things that are gonna go to a POTW. Um, as well as nuclear waste that's regulated by the Atomic Energy Act. Also irrigation return flows from the farming industry. And that's because all of these things are already regulated by a different program. For example, if something is regulated by the Clean Water Act, it's not also gonna be regulated by the hazardous waste regulations. Now it may be regulated up to a certain um, extent, but once it's discharged, as a point source, the Clean Water Act takes over, and that's just so that there's no confusion on management. So what makes a waste a hazardous waste? Well, um, there's a very lengthy rule and a complex regulatory definition, but more simply put, it is a solid, liquid, semi-solid, or a contained gas that has properties that make it dangerous are capable of having a harmful effect on human health or the environment. And there are specific lists of waste that US EPA has determined are hazardous. And this is because they were found to pose substantial hazards to human health or the environment. And they're separated by um, the way in which they are generated into four different lists. We have the F, K, P, and U lists. The F list contains waste that are from non-specific sources that can be generated by many different industries. An example of an F listed waste would be a spent solvent. The K list includes waste that are from specific sources and industries. And there are 13 different industries or categories for K listed waste. And those include sectors like wood preservation, inorganic pigment manufacturing and ink formulation. The P and U lists are both unused commercial chemical products, but the difference here is that that P list contains ones that are acutely hazardous, which just means that they're dangerous in smaller quantities. Waste can also be hazardous if they exhibit one of these characteristics. Is it ignitable? Is it corrosive? Is it reactive? Is it toxic? There are approximately 40 um, different things that a waste could be toxic for. For example, it could be characteristically toxic for various metals or volatiles. All right, we've reached our first poll question. So what do you think is regulated by Ohio's hazardous waste program? We have couple options here. Is it household hazardous waste, cement kiln dust waste, oil and gas exploration drilling waste, or none of the above? Okay, I am launching the poll now. Please go ahead and make your selections. It looks about 75% of you have responded so far. Those of you who have not yet responded, go ahead and submit your responses. And we'll close the poll in a few minutes or moments. Okay, we're now going to close the poll. Let me share the results with everyone.
All right, so kind of evenly split there with the last three options. Um, maybe a little bit of a trick question. Um, the answer was none of the above. I think we just need to get back to the presentation here. I'm still seeing the poll question on my end. And I have hidden the poll, so um, let's see what happens. I might just take a second here to get the screen back. Okay, so I'm not sure. April, can you see if maybe the screen stops sharing since we can't see the presentation? There we go. All right, I think we're back. Okay, so what fun would the regulations be if we didn't have exclusions? Now we have a rule that specifies what we exclu exclude from hazardous waste regulation, but we've highlighted some, just a few of them here on this slide. And Congress decided it would be uh, burdensome if we had to regulate each residence. So we don't regulate any um, hazardous waste that's generated at a household. We only regulate waste generated at a place of business. We also don't regulate um, utility waste from coal combustion or oil and gas exploration drilling waste. Now I'll point out that one of the first things that you should do when you're making a hazardous waste determination is to see if your waste meets an exclusion. And if that's the case that you don't need to characterize it anymore, um, you're done, you can just manage it as a solid or industrial waste going forward. For our visual learners, this graphic just shows how we drill down to figure out what wastes are hazardous. So if you have a product and it's being used for its intended purpose, that's not a waste. Emissions from manufacturing, that's not regulated by us. Waste that don't belong to one of those lists and, does, and it doesn't exhibit a characteristic, that's gonna get pushed out as well. So what we're left with are hazardous waste. We have a few different handler types. Generators are the ones that are making the hazardous waste. And rather than having to get a permit for their management of hazardous waste, if they do certain things, they're exempt from obtaining that permit. Now I've listed some of the rule references um, here on this slide for the conditions for exemption for the different generator categories and also for um, the satellite accumulation area requirements. But there are some additional regulations that have nothing to do with being exempt from permitting. They're cornerstones, we call these independent requirements. And these include things like characterizing waste that's generated, everyone needs to do that, determining your generator category, obtaining an EPA ID number, using the proper hazardous waste manifest when you're shipping offsite, things like that. So we're just gonna briefly go over the requirements for generators. There are different generator types or categories based on how much you generate. The more hazardous waste that you generate or accumulate, the more requirements that you have to follow. So first we have very small quantity generators, also known as VSQGs. And these businesses generate approximately 25 gallons or less of hazardous waste in a calendar month. And the two main things that they need to do are to properly characterize their waste, and then ensure that their hazardous waste gets to a properly permitted treatment storage or disposal facility. We also call that an authorized facility. The next size we have are small quantity generators. And these businesses generate between 100 and 1000 kilograms of hazardous waste in a month. And they have to do some additional things. So you can see there are a lot more bullet points on this slide than the previous one. So they need to notify Ohio EPA of their activities and obtain an EPA ID number. And they also need to re-notify every four years. And that was something that was added when we adopted the generator improvement rules that I mentioned previously. 
SQGs also have container and tank management requirements, and that includes proper labeling. They have certain preparedness and prevention responsibilities, like making arrangements with their emergency responders. And that's so that those emergency responders are familiar with the types of hazardous waste that are stored at the facility, the evacuation routes, things of that nature. And the SQGs also um, need to make sure that areas where they have hazardous waste, so um, where it's being generated, treated, or accumulated, has proper emergency equipment. So things like fire extinguishers and an internal communication system. They also have to maintain aisle space so that people and equipment can move freely to respond to emergencies. They have to train their employees so that, they, so that they're familiar with the proper waste handling and emergency procedures that are relevant to their positions and conduct weekly inspections. They need to use a hazardous waste manifest when they're shipping hazardous waste offsite and also comply with the land disposal restrictions, which means that they need to make sure that hazardous waste is treated either to a certain concentration or by a certain method before being land disposed. If a signed manifest isn't returned to an SQG, they need to notify us within 60 days, and this is called an exception report. As far as record keeping goes, they need to maintain records for three years. And SQGs are limited to a 180 day accumulation period. Lastly, we have um, large quantity generators or LQGs. And these businesses generate more than 1000 kilograms of hazardous waste in a calendar month. And you'll see here that they have even more requirements. There are similar requirements to what I just mentioned for small quantity generators, but they're a little bit more in depth. Their notification needs to be done every two years, and that can be done doing, during their required biennial report. They have more in-depth preparedness and prevention requirements as well, such as developing a written contingency plan and more in-depth training requirements and documentation. And that includes having written job titles, job descriptions, and the type and amount of training given to each person that's filling a position related to hazardous waste activities. If a sign manifest isn't returned to an LQG, they need to submit an exception report to Ohio EPA within 45 days. They are also required to do closure in the area in which they accumulated hazardous waste. And this includes some notification and documentation requirements that were also added as part of the generator improvement rules. LQGs are limited to a 90 day accumulation period. So as you can see, um, as you move up in generator categories, you have more requirements and you're also restricted to a shorter time period that you can accumulate hazardous waste. After generation, the hazardous waste needs to get to the ultimate disposal location, and that is done by a hazardous waste transporter. Some of their, their requirements include having to notify us that they are a transporter so that they can obtain a US EPA ID number, using the proper pa paperwork to track what's being transported, and keeping records of um, the manifest for three years. Also, if um, a release happens to occur during transport, they are required to respond to that and clean it up. Next, hazardous waste reaches its end of life location, which is a treatment, storage, or disposal facility, also called a TSDF. And these facilities have permits issued by Ohio EPA. To obtain a permit, a facility needs to submit an application and once that's reviewed and determined to be complete, we would issue a permit that is good for a 10-year period. So what makes up a permit application? Well, quite a bit of information, actually. So I've highlighted some of the main items here. First, we need to know what's happening at the site, so some general process information. We also need a waste analysis plan. And this is an important component because the facility is required to ensure that the hazardous waste that they're accepting 
is what's included on that manifest and also what the generator says is being generated. They also need to ensure compliance with the land disposal restrictions. So making sure that treatment is meeting certain levels before it can be disposed. The permit application also needs to include information on the hazardous waste units. For example, the size of the storage unit, what the material is constructed of, are there any secondary containment structures, things like that. The application also needs to include a closure cost estimate and financial assurance. And in simple terms, this just means that there needs to be money available to remove and clean up any hazardous waste that's potentially left behind if the owner or the operator were to walk away from the site. And financial assurance also provides third-party liability coverage for, for any accidental occurrences that happen at, um, due to the facility operations. The issued permit includes things like permit limits, which could be an annual amount of hazardous waste that they can receive, as well as unit specific limits. For example, how many containers or what volume that they can store um, in a con container storage area. And if they're doing treatment, we also may specify a specific uh, treatment rate. The permit also needs to, um, the permit also lists the things that they need to notify Ohio EPA of, such as reporting any non-compliance to us, letting us know if they've implemented their contingency plan, notifying us of any changes to the permit or the permit application, and we refer to those as modifications. And the permit also spells out closure and corrective action requirements, and we're going to touch on those two things here towards the end of the presentation. We view both the permit application and the permit as living documents. And changes can be made to these um, for various reasons and there we have a few different levels of modifications. The lowest level is a class one. And this is for minor administrative changes. So maybe there's a typo in the document or a facility contact person changes that would be a class one. One step up from that, we have a class 1A modification, and that's if we have something that's just a little bit more than administrative in nature, but nothing substantial has changed at the facility. Class two modifications trigger public participation and also the director's signature. And class three modifications require a draft issuance from Ohio EPA to receive public comment. An example of something that would be a class three modification would be if the facility is trying to increase their storage capacity by more than 25% of what they're already permitted for. Now, Ohio EPA also has the ability to unilaterally modify a permit. So if something changes and the facility is unwilling to submit that modification, Ohio EPA can do it. Um, it's, it's rare, but it can happen. When a permit is approaching the end of that 10 year period, the permittee needs to apply for a renewal and that needs to be done at least six months prior to expiration if they wanna continue their operations. Otherwise, they would need to start the closure process for their hazardous waste units. We have to issue any permit renewal as a draft action to get public comment on it before we can issue a final document. But I will say that a facility can continue operating under their expired permit as long as they submitted that renewal application in a timely manner. All right, we've reached our next poll question. How many permitted facilities do you think that we have here in Ohio? We have three options. Do you think it is 100, 27, or 43? All right, I'm launching the poll now. So please go ahead and make your selections.
All right, looks like about 75% of you have responded so far. Um, those of you who have not responded, please go ahead and submit your responses now, and we'll be closing the poll in a few moments. Okay, I'm going to close the poll now. All right, so the majority of you got that right. 59% of you said 43. Let's see if we can hide this poll here and get back to our presentation. Awesome. Here. All right, so we have 43 permitted treatment storage disposal facilities throughout the state of Ohio. Uh, with the Northeast District having the most, they have 14, including a few hazardous waste incinerators. The Central District area has three, including one that stores batteries prior to recycling them. The Southeast District has six, uh, including one that's treating their own hazardous waste that they generate during their manufacturing process. Northwest has nine including a commercial hazardous waste landfill and a commercial deep well injector. And Southwest has 11, including one that blends hazardous waste into a fuel. And I'll also mention that we're uh, in the process of permitting some new facilities that will be handling airbags from the Takata airbag recall. Also linked here is a PDF for commercial facilities accepting hazardous waste. And this is a pretty helpful document because it also specifies the management activity um, that they do. For example, if they do incineration, if they're a landfill, if they're doing metals recovery. And this information might be helpful to you if you're trying to narrow down where your hazardous waste should go. All right, so now that we've talked about what we regulate and who we regulate, we can kind of go over the ways that we implement our program. Our delega delegation from US EPA requires that we conduct compliance monitoring. And there's a few tools that we can use to do that. The most common is probably conducting compliance inspections. And we refer to these as compliance evaluation inspections or CEIs. And this is where we go out to a generator facility or a TSDF and we um, evaluate their operations and, uh, with their compliance with our rules and or their permit. We also review reports such as groundwater monitoring reports. These are reviewed by our geologists. We also receive biennial reports from our large quantity generators and our RICFRA information management group reviews those. And I mentioned that certain sites are required to have um, financial assurance. So we have actually have staff that are dedicated to reviewing that information as well. We also go out and we conduct inspections if we receive a complaint from the public. And the purpose there is just to determine if we have any hazardous waste violations. And we also do investigations if a facility um, self-discloses any violations to us. We are also required to have an enforcement program to ensure the implementation of the hazardous waste regulations. Under the law, we have provisions for both civil and criminal enforcement actions. And we also have the ability to refer cases to US EPA. Now, our, our enforcement actions are to ensure protection of human health and the environment, to get cleanup completed, and to make sure that businesses are compliant with management standards. So for example, if we have a facility that has a tank system that needs to be upgraded or maybe personnel training needs to be conducted, we can issue orders to require that they do that. And we often, um, we often do orders to require people to implement closure or cleanup of an area where hazardous waste management activity took place that was unauthorized. We also issue penalties to deter violations. Now, orders can take a couple of different forms. If they're issued by Ohio EPA, these are called Director's Final Findings and Orders, or DFFOs. And these can be consensually agreed upon by parties or unilaterally issued by Ohio EPA. 
We also can refer cases to the attorney general's office and they would file a complaint and then an order can be issued by a judge or consensually agreed upon by the parties. We also have a special investigation unit that can do, um, they can take criminal action depending on what activities took place. All right, so we have a compliance side to our worker program that we kind of talked about. Um, but we also have a remedial side that addresses closure, post-closure, and corrective action. RICRA was designed to be a proactive system, and under that system, there are a number of options that permitted and non-permitted facilities can use to store, to treat, and dispose of hazardous waste. And this can be done in defined hazardous waste management units. This slide shows the different types of units there are. Um, there are specific rules that govern each type of unit. So we have rules for lagoons and surface impoundments, for landfills, land treatment units, waste piles, and then miscellaneous units, that would be um, tanks or containment buildings. In these rules, there are minimum technology requirements. So they have to be built and constructed in a way um, as to hold and contain hazardous waste to make sure that it's sequestered from the environment. We have rules for general closure requirements for both permitted and non-permitted facilities. We call these interim status facilities. And these rules require some form of monitoring to ensure that engineered requirements are met and that there aren't any releases to the environment. So there are groundwater monitoring requirements in these rules. If a facility needs to stop using a unit, it can go through a closure which means that hazardous waste needs to be removed and then the unit itself needs to be decontaminated. And that includes everything that's associated with that unit. So if there are any liners or a leachate collection system, then the hazardous waste needs to be removed and decontaminated from those systems as well. If there's a release to the environment, that needs to be sampled um, and it needs to meet certain types of, of human health and other standards to make sure that there aren't any ongoing releases. Now, if we can do that, we can achieve what we call a clean closure, and that's the ultimate goal. But sometimes, um, however, a facility might not be able to do that. So we do have provisions for what we call waste in place closure. And we'll talk a little bit about that in um, the post-closure section. Closure needs to be done through a specific mechanism. So either through a permit or if the facility doesn't have a permit, then we need an order to require closure. A lot of our closures come through our inspection staff. So if they find a violation at a non-permitted facility, we issue director's final findings and orders. And those orders um, define the kind of hazardous waste mismanagement, the constituents that could have been released, and then we have orders to develop a closure plan to do the investigation work. And then standards that will be used under closure will also look at what decontamination or engineering activities that will be necessary to complete closure. For the past several years, we've averaged about 10 active closure sites, but we used to do a lot more than that. From 1992 to present, we've done over 700 closure certifications all over the state. Now our closure program has a wide range of activities that we look at and closure can vary from something that's really simple. So maybe this looks like uh, a pad decontamination and just some sampling to determine if there's been a release. But sometimes there's a lot of engineering and decontamination that needs to be completed. And these can be very expensive remediation projects if there have been releases. Post-closure care is, uh, is for when we can't clean up to certain standards. 
So in this case, we have to be able to maintain these hazardous waste units. And that's to make sure that that hazardous waste remains sequestered from the environment. For example, um, it could look like maintaining covers in a leachate collection system and monitoring groundwater to make sure that there aren't any releases from the units. We have to have financial assurance to make sure that companies that own these units are viable. And if they're not, that we can access that money to perform final closure if needed. All right, we've reached our last poll question. How long do you think post-closure care lasts? We have three options here. 50 years, 25 years, or it varies. Okay, I'm launching the poll now. Please go ahead and submit your um, responses. Responses are coming in pretty well. It looks like we're about 75% of you have responded so far. Those of you who have not yet responded, please go ahead and submit your responses. We'll be closing the polls in a few moments. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll now. All right, so the majority of you uh, got where I was going there. 85% of you said it varies. Slight trick question, um, only because I didn't put what our, our goal year is on there. Bill, can you hide the poll so we get back to the presentation? So under our rules for post-closure, we're really looking for a 30-year period, but that can um, vary. It can be shortened or extended on a case-by-case -case basis. We have general post-closure requirements um, for permitted and non-permitted facilities. We have those rural references here on this slide. This is a map of Ohio that shows um, the location of our post-closure sites. There are about 75 of them that we're monitoring right now. So we have all different types of post-closure units. We have hazardous waste landfills, we have residual landfills that have a cap but no real leachate collection system in place and in that case we're doing groundwater monitoring. We have land treatment units that don't have caps or liners and a lot of our newer post-closure units are areas where soil is contaminated above standards or groundwater is contaminated but it's not flowing off site so we're monitoring it. We can terminate post-closure if the final standards are met. And for many reasons, sometimes we can't do that. We can renew the post-closure period beyond 30 years, but of course that comes at a financial burden. These are some facilities that are within five years of the end of their post-closure period. And we can renew, renew a permit or create new orders to extend that post-closure period. And many of these facilities still have hazardous waste that needs to be um, sequestered from the environment. All right, moving on to corrective action. Now, corrective action is a little bit different. It's much broader in scope. The closure is in predefined units and corrective action is for the entire site. And that can include any kind of management of solid waste, hazardous waste, or hazardous substances anywhere at the facility um, 
anywhere at the site, going back in time when other facilities owned that site. It's handled a little bit differently too. Um, there aren't any rules that govern it, but there, there's a statutory basis. And then there are also policies and guidance that we have from US EPA. We administer corrective action through permitting and orders. We can also perform voluntary corrective actions without a permit or order, and that's through DER's voluntary action program. And the goal here is to restore, restore the facility to its maximum potential use, while at the same time protecting human health and the environment. All right, these are the general steps that we follow for corrective action. And first, we'll look at the site to see where solid and hazardous waste and hazardous substances were managed historically. And then we perform an investigation to define where contamination is and where it's not. So just delineating the, those contamination areas. If we see we have any major problems, so if there's contamination going off site or interacting with people through vapor intrusion, um, we perform interim measures at this stage to prevent that human health involvement. Now, if we don't have any immediate actions that we need to do, we'll go into um, a corrective measure study. And this is where we will define, um, based upon the investigation where we have contamination above standards, we define alternatives to cleaning up the facility. Um, we present this information to the general public in a statement of basis. Now, once the public comments on these decisions, we can go back and make modifications. And then we present that information to our director in a decision document. And once that's signed by the director, we can implement corrective action at the facility. So Ohio has 256 corrective action sites on what we call our baseline list. And most of these sites are super fun or circle of sites. These are larger sites that and facilities that have a lot of years of waste management activities. And these sites are administered through um, our RICRA grants, and we have commitments to monitor the progress. Some of the ways that we monitor the progress is through the following environmental indicators that we track and then we present to US EPA. So is human health under control? Is groundwater contamination under control? Is the remedy construction complete? And then that last step would be, are the corrective actions complete? To date, we have achieved the following at our corrective action sites. 95% have achieved human health under control. 92% have groundwater under control. And then 75%, um, the remedy has been constructed and now we're in the monitoring phase for completing corrective action. All right, just to kind of summarize what we've discussed during this presentation, we have rules for generators, transporters, and treatment storage disposal facilities who require permits. And generators can be exempt from permitting provided that they follow certain conditions that are specific to their generator category. We require closure for large quantity generators and also for hazardous waste management un management units at permitted facilities or facilities that are managed that manage hazardous waste in an unauthorized area. We administer closure in those instances through permits and also through directors final findings and orders. Now, alternatively, uh, releases of hazardous waste or hazardous substances are addressed through site-wide corrective action, which are administered either through a permit, through an order, or voluntary um, through DER's voluntary action program. All right, that kind of sums up the presentation there. Um, and I do think we have a couple questions, a uh, couple minutes for questions. Thank you, Chrissy. Yes, it looks like we probably have about five or six minutes for questions. And so we are going to go ahead and review what has been submitted today. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the questions pane. We will do our best to answer as many questions as possible. If we don't have the answer for your question during the Q&A portion, we will reach out to you via email following today's session. And it looks like the first question is, 
Okay. If my facility stores hazardous waste, do I need a permit? So it's possible that you could need a permit. That really depends on your business. If, if you're a generator of hazardous waste, it's probably much easier to follow the specific conditions for exemption. But if for some reason you're unable to meet those conditions, then yes, you would need a permit. Um, there are also some businesses that involve storing hazardous waste from offsite for, for more than 10 days, and those businesses do require a permit. And I should probably also clarify that transporters of hazardous waste don't need permits, at least not here in Ohio. They just need to notify of their transporter activities and have an EPA ID number. Ready for your second question? I'm ready. Okay. Um, how often does Ohio EPA inspect a facility? Okay, so um, as, as part of our commitment to US EPA, we inspect roughly 20% of our large quantity generators in a year. So that might average out to about once every five years if you're a large quantity generator. And that is based off of our biennial report data. We also inspect TSDFs on a little bit more uh, frequent basis. So maybe a few times a year, um, We I think I mentioned we also do complaint inspections. There's really no set amount of complaint inspections that we do. We, we follow up on, on all complaints. And there may be various reasons that we also inspect very small quantity generators or small quantity generators, but um, basically that 20% for our LQG is our goal. All righty. Um, do you have a list of permitted treatment storage and disposal facilities that I can use? Yes, yeah, so we we have a list available on our website. We have all of our permit documents on there, applications and, and permits. If you make your way to Ohio EPA's website and you find our division, which is the Division of Environmental Response and Revitalization, there's gonna be um, like a left-hand navigation pane and there's a section for permits and notifications. It's actually pretty easy to find if you can find your way to, to our division. Um, but I also included that link in one of the slides and I'm, it might've been included in the chat as well. That was for the commercial facilities that accept hazardous waste from offsite. And that actually might be more, more useful if you're trying to find <laughs> a treatment or disposal facility for your hazardous waste, since um, some of the facilities that have permits that are on our website, um, they're actually permitted for um, their, own, their own activities. Okay. Um can my business treat hazardous waste without a permit? Um, I guess the simple answer here is yes, but there are stipulations. So if you're, you're a generator, you can treat hazardous waste in tanks and containers or containment buildings without obtaining a permit as long as you're following um, the rule requirements for small or large quantity generators. Very small quantity generators can treat hazardous waste, but they need to be following the large quantity generator requirements. And I'll also clarify that you can only treat hazardous waste that's generated at your own site. Um, you're also limited to the type of treatment that you can do. So you, you can't treat hazardous waste by thermal treatment or incineration without a permit. And you also can't treat hazardous waste in a waste pile, a surface impoundment, or a miscellaneous treatment unit. Um, we also have we have a guidance document on our website for generator treatment, and that explains everything in more detail. Um, if you have any questions, you can always follow up. All right, that actually looks like that's about the, as much time as we have for the questions today. Um, if you have submitted a question that we have not answered, we will be responding back to you after the webinar. Thank you, Christy, for your great presentation. Um, thank you um, to our subject matter experts, Tammy and Zach, and thank you for the technical assistance staff behind the scenes making everything work well. Um, and thank you to everyone for attending the 2022 Virtual Compliance Assistance Conference session. Before we end the session today, we would like to point out, point to your attention to another one of today's environmental fun facts. There are several agencies that regulate different types of environmental concerns, and with so many state departments and agencies, it can be difficult to determine exactly who handles a particular issue. For example, the Department of Agriculture regulates food safety, pesticide management, and concentrated animal feeding operation permits. The Department of Commerce, State Fire Marshal Division, oversees gas station cleanup and underground and above ground storage tanks. 
The Department of Natural Resources regulates oil and gas well drilling, mining activities, floodplain management, hunting and state parks. And the Ohio Department of Health activities include indoor air quality, private water systems, radon, and lead paint in homes. And lastly, Ohio EPA hosts a series of webinars throughout the year on a variety of environmental topics. This slide provides information on how to register for these upcoming webinars, where to find recordings of previous webinars, and how to sign up for and receive notifications of upcoming webinars through our Ohio EPA Customer Support Center. With that, we will end this session of Ohio EPA's 2022 Virtual Compliance Assistance Conference. We hope you are able to join us for another conference session soon. And thank you again for joining us today and have a great day. Thank you.